This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I'm delighted and honored that you're here. Self-work is all about trying to reach people who might be already very interested in psychological and emotional issues, but also those who've been initially diagnosed with anxiety or depression, or even those of you who might not darken the door of a therapist's office, but just be curious enough to listen into a podcast. As you listen today, I hope that you'll think about leaving me a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you listen. That gives me so much information about who you are and what you want and why you're listening. So I invite you to do that, and I'd be really grateful. Thanks so much. I had a great interview with someone this week, and he was a fabulous listener. So that experience made me decide that this week's episode was going to be on three common listening issues, making assumptions, needing to be right, and avoidance of conflict. I'll, as usual, not only talk about the problems, but about what to do about it. And our listener email today is from a young woman who is a sexual abuse survivor, but wasn't believed by her family until now. She's asking what's the best course for her to follow. And the most important message for me is for her not to be re-victimized by the experience. So welcome to the Self Work Podcast. Sit back and relax, and let's talk about listening. I was interviewed last week by a man named Rami Webby. W-E-H-B-I, and he's a doctor, in fact, a DO, in his second year of residency. I was amazed to hear that because he's, he's also the host of the podcast Beyond Medicine. How he has the time to host a podcast as well as be a resident, his ability to time manage and do without sleep must be incredible. What did I like about him so much? His curiosity. He actually reminded me of one of my brothers toward the end of the interview when he said that he came away after each of his interviews believing that this was his favorite interview. (laughs) It's very flattering to the interviewee, mind you, but I caught the impression that it was his ability to focus and be curious that created that dynamic for him. Oh, I forgot about the part about how he was like my brother. After going to a restaurant or two with my brother, he'd so often say, now that was the best food I'd ever had or best steak or best pasta or whatever it was. So Rami was a lot like one of my brothers. He wasn't just asking questions that had been taken from skimming the book, because, of course, the interview was about perfectly hidden depression. So they weren't just questions from the book. And then he checked off the answers. We actually talked longer than the time booked, because he asked me if we could talk a little more. As I spoke, he took time to think about what I was saying and formulate his next question. I could see him writing down thoughts as I talked. It was a very, very positive experience on my end. And I told him so. As I said before, we were talking about perfectly hidden depression, and he seemed fascinated by a couple of ideas. One, that we are all influenced heavily by our childhoods, but that we can alter its influence. And two, that the concept of self-acceptance was different from apathy or resignation. I've done podcasts on both those topics, as we've talked about how you know you're being governed by your childhood strategies and how awareness of your vulnerabilities actually gives you strength and empowerment. So that's not what this podcast is about. This podcast is about how it feels to be really listened to, really listened to, and how perhaps you can become a better listener yourself. I did a podcast on listening a long time ago, literally within the first few weeks. In fact, it's episode eight. I wanted to make sure that I got an episode out on it because I think listening is becoming a lost art. As we text and interpret text, we try to use a bunch of emojis to explain. You can get mad or defensive because of your interpretation of what was texted. It's really confusing. Now, I love texting, mind you, but it doesn't make for really good listening. Tuning into someone else is an art, as I said, and it's a wonderful gift to give someone and to receive yourself. 
Episode 8 did explain a technique that is a wonderful therapeutic exercise for couples. It's called the eye-to-eye technique, and I'd recommend if you have problems listening to your partner or your friend, that you listen to it together and even try the exercise. I'll warn you, it's really hard to do, and it catches most people by surprise just how hard it is. But I thought today we'd talk about three factors that get in the way of really good listening, and the first one is making assumptions. One of the magical things about getting to know someone is that you don't necessarily make assumptions about what they're going to say. Now, after you've been together for a while, or when you've worked together at the same office for a couple of years, your mind creates a pattern of who that person is, what they look like, and what they say in different circumstances become part of what you know about them. In some ways, it's a way for a human being to imprint the world around him or herself, to take a mental picture of what's safe, for example, scoping things out, making assumptions, or we might say predictions, about what was coming next so that you could feel prepared. You might be a Neanderthal man or someone in the 21st century, it doesn't really matter, but keeping safe is important. Keeping secure is important. You can predict that you might need to fight or that you might need to run. We make these kinds of assumptions and predictions all the time. Think about when you're driving. You watch the cars around you picking up pieces of information about whether or not the other driver is using good judgment or whether they're about to roar past you in the right lane to make sure they get in the left lane before the road work begins or something like that. We're all assessing, assuming, and predicting from the info around us. But making assumptions gets in the way of really listening especially if you've been with someone a really long time, like your partner or your spouse or your child, your mother, your father. You believe you know just exactly what they're about to say, what story they're going to tell next, what old joke is coming. And some of that is familiarity and can actually feel intimate. But when that familiarity gets in the way, when it leads to impatience or contempt, that's not good at all. One of the things I ask couples to do is to tell me about their memories of their first date. I ask what they learned about each other on that date and have them write it down. It's usually nice to see how much they smile as they reminisce. And then I ask them to tell me, what's the newest thing they've learned about the other one right now? And there's usually dead silence or uncomfortable confusion. What, what do you mean? Something new. Or they'll kind of squirm. I don't want to make them squirm. It's just that they're beginning to realize, perhaps, that they've stopped being curious about the other one. And instead, they believe they know just about everything they need to know about their partner. I understand that we know a lot about each other, but maybe your relationship is in a rut, and you can get out of it. Another one of the assignments I'd like to give couples who have children is to go out to dinner by themselves. But there's one rule— They cannot talk about the kids, not one peep. They come back and say everything from, wow, that was different and fun, to, you know, we didn't have much to say. And the work becomes very clear. Think about it. Most couples spend hours away from each other every day. And those hours can change you. You can learn or experience something new. You have a new insight. You eat a new food, whatever. But if we make assumptions that we know everything, there's nothing new, then we're not going to be curious. And they begin to assume, and they tune out, or you tune out. (laughs) For example, how many times have you asked your spouse or your kid or whatever, how was your day, and you think you know what's about to come? And maybe you do, but maybe if you really tune in, you don't. Here's the second problem needing to be right all the time. I'm not going to make the effort to listen to other people's viewpoints if I have to be right. And so many couples fight about who's right and who's wrong. No one is really listening. And if you're proven wrong somehow, you can't wait until the next battle when, by damn, you're going to win. Now, I'm not talking about gaslighting, which is the penultimate version of this fight where a narcissist will pull the rug up from under you and lead you to begin to doubt your own reality. That's very effective for control, and obviously there's no true listening going on. But needing to be right all the time is such an easy habit to get into. In fact, I had a couple the other day 
who in my office tend to bicker about who's right. And, of course, when this kind of fighting happens continuously, then resentment and defensiveness can fuel this pattern. That particular session, they were describing the fact that their daughter always argues with them. You can't tell her anything that she doesn't disagree with you about. When I gently suggested that perhaps she had learned that habit from the two of them, they both sat silent. Most parents who are trying to be good parents want to model great communication for their kids, but most of us don't do it ourselves, so we fail. To give this pattern up, to decide it doesn't matter who's right, takes honoring and accepting the fact that we are all limited by our perspective. Your perspective becomes your truth. But it's only your perspective. Just ask three people about an accident that they all witnessed. There will be a lot of difference in their stories. And in fact, there's really great research that shows that your attitude towards something heavily influences what you actually even see. So if you don't like someone or don't identify with them, you're far more likely to find them at fault, for example. I'm going to tell a story on myself, which I tend to do, because I'm certainly not above and beyond any of this myself. But this example actually happened when I was in graduate school training. My very first client was describing his relationship to me, and it was volatile. He quite willingly and easily told me the story of how at 3 o'clock a.m. he banged on his girlfriend's apartment door and made her come down to sit with him in the car while he finished yelling at her. He wouldn't let her go back to her apartment until he finished. He explained it away, saying he was a little drunk and that he'd apologize the next day. When I took the case to my supervisor, her first question was, so what did you say about the domestic violence? I just sat there, stunned, and trying to hide it. I had not heard anything as domestic violence. For you see, I myself was involved in an abusive relationship. So my own experience altered my perspective and even what I was hearing. Now, in the meeting with my supervisor, unfortunately, I wasn't mature enough to cope very well, so I think I made up some answer like, oh, I thought I'd build rapport before I confronted him, blah, blah. But I learned something very important that day. My own perspective was going to get in my way if I wasn't very vigilant as a therapist, and even then, I would have blind spots. It's very humbling to remember that. So if you own that all you have is your perspective and you stay humble about it, then you won't fight as much about whether or not you're right or wrong. Because listening and being a part of a conversation is simply more important to you than winning. In fact, I've heard many a therapist say that they tell their patients, if you're going to fight a lot about who's right and wrong, you might as well also fight about what attorney you're going to use for your divorce. It's that troublesome and that destructive. The third pattern that I wanted to talk about today is maybe something that's a little more difficult to see. It's when you're avoiding conflict and you don't want to hear what the other person is saying. Now, this is different from having to be right. It's when you're listening, but you don't necessarily want to hear what the other person has to say because it doesn't fit with an idea you've already had or an agenda that you'd like to push through, or you're avoiding conflict and any potential for you not getting what you want. So it has a little bit of selfishness and a lot of the issue of control. Let's take a conversation about going on a vacation. Now, interestingly enough, I trained at a family institute in Dallas, and one of the exercises we gave incoming families was to sit down and plan a vacation. You learn so much about family dynamics when you ask a family to do that, or a couple. But anyway, back to our conversation. The first person says, well, I just want to relax. That's all I care about. I can hear that beach calling my name. And their partner says, oh, me too. But I do get bored pretty easily. I love to walk on the beach for sure. First person again. Oh, yeah? Sounds like to me we're pretty much on the same page. The other says, I really want to spend time together. And then the first person says, oh, me too. I hope you can hear that these two aren't really listening to each other at all. One sees the beach as a haven, some place to get a drink with an umbrella in it and do nothing. 
The other wants together time, but also may not be excited about long hours on the beach. Neither particularly wants to hear the other's viewpoint. Maybe they're avoiding conflict, or they're just in a bad habit of not listening. Because for conflict to exist, then you have to compromise. And maybe that means you don't do exactly what you want to do. When I listen to these kinds of conversations in my office, I can kind of get lost because it seems like everyone's being nice, but no real decisions are made. No compromises occur. And interestingly enough, what happens is often that one or both people believe that there was compromise. They really did have a great conversation about it. However, usually one person in the end will be acquiescing to the other and doesn't have a strong voice or personality to say, no, I'm listening to you, but that's not really what I want to do on vacation. This is my take on what I like. And the other person says the same thing. But when one person acquiesces, the other can feel kind of confused and slighted and lost because I thought we agreed. Maybe you've had these kinds of conversations yourself. So how do you fix this? First and foremost, you can't avoid conflict. Both of you have to talk about what you want and then listen to what the other person wants as well and really hear them. They can be quite opposite, but you can't have a compromise if there's only one of you being honest about what you want. Think about a football team. Both sides have to set their positions before a play can happen. They take a stance, right? What if one team took a position and was on the scrimmage line and the other team just ran around? No play would occur, or no organized play at least. It's the same with conversations. You both have to take a stance, respectfully, but you both have to take a stance and then compromise. We had an agreement in my family that it was everybody's vacation if we went on one. So each of us got to do the one thing we really wanted to do. Now, there were only three of us, so that was fairly simple. But it did feel like compromise. And it feels very respectful when it's pulled off without resentment. Everybody gives and everybody receives. It's not that there aren't a lot of other problems with communication or not listening, but I thought these three would be helpful to talk about. Let's go over them once again. If you make assumptions or predictions too much, you're tuning out and you're not staying curious. If you need to be right, you're not realizing the reality perspective or staying humble about your own. And the third is if you're avoiding conflict and hearing only what you want to hear, you can insist that both voices be heard and compromise be reached. That may mean you don't get what you want all the time but you also get to give the gift of respect and compassion, and you receive it. Good luck with that. The listener email today, which is a regular feature of self-work, is about a very painful topic, sexual abuse. So again, I warn you, if you've been sexually abused, to watch that this might trigger you. Here comes her email. I came across your website and hope you can give me some advice. I'm 26 years old. I was molested for years as a child by my aunt's husband. She caught him once, but long story short, he convinced me to tell her nothing happened. Throughout the years, I believe she knew something was wrong, but she chose to live in denial. Now she wants to leave him. She told me a lot of memories are coming back to her and asked me, did it happen? And I said, yes. She's very upset and has asked me if I'm okay with her talking to my aunt or grandmother about it as she feels alone and scared. I don't know what to tell her. I feel like I've finally moved on. I married and just had a baby and finally feel happy. Part of me wants to keep it in the past, and I dread having to talk to anyone about it. But I also wonder if putting it out there will take away the load of this secret I've been carrying. Does telling people usually help survivors? Or will this just hash up old feelings that I feel I have finally been able to move on from? Great question. So here's my answer. In fact, I said to her, I'm afraid my answer may not help all that much because I think it could go either way. Many people find that when they reveal what happened and people believe them, it does take away that load you speak of because not being believed can hurt in a different way than the actual sexual abuse, but very deeply. 
And yet, it may also bring out old feelings or even flashbacks of what happened. So, that's a risk that you take. You may also experience more anger with your aunt. I'm not sure what you did with your anger, but it still may be a part of you. I'd suggest that you and she go to some counseling sessions together to work that out. And really, I don't think it's her place necessarily to talk with your family members without you present. My suggestion would be to do that together after you've been to a session or more with a common counselor. You want to make sure that you know why you're telling your experience and not have it re-victimize you in any way. For example, if you believe that a certain outcome will happen if you tell, then you may be setting yourself up for hurt. However, please know this as well. You can also decide not to give her permission to share your secret and recommend she get in therapy for support. Even though you're happy and I'm so glad you are, congratulations on that new baby. Sometimes when victims watch their children grow up, that very experience can evoke painful memories of abuse, even if you believe it's in the past. There's something about seeing and experiencing your child at the same age you were when the abuse occurred that can evoke emotions or memories. So there are many ways for those feelings to reemerge because unfortunately, sexual abuse does a lot of damage, but you can heal. Good luck to you. I'm so sad that all of this has happened to you, and you must know that it was never your fault. I'm very grateful that you've tuned in to Self Work. Some of you have written to me that you've purchased Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free from the Perfectionism that Masks Your Depression. Wow, that's a mouthful. And that pleases me so much. I hope that it's helpful to you. I know I talked about reviews at the beginning of the podcast, but I'd love your reviews for the book on Amazon, too. I love doing this podcast and love answering your questions. Please email me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com or come join my Facebook closed group at Facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. That's Facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. And you can ask me specific questions there. Or, of course, we have a wealth of wisdom and knowledge in the now almost 1,500 people who are part of the group. You can go to my website at drmargaretrutherford.com and subscribe there. That's a really easy way to keep track of the blog post and my weekly podcast. And of course, Perfectly Hidden Depression is now available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, indie bookstores, or your local bookstore. So if you want to know my particular treatment strategy that I have with all my patients, then pick up Perfectly Hidden Depression. Yes, it's about perfectionism, all right. But it's really very applicable to anyone who wants to try to understand how their past has affected their present and what they can do about it. Thank you so much for being here. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.